Hello everyone, I'm Marita Golden and welcome to a special edition of Creative Conversations with Marita. Uh, during the lockdown, I initiated a Creative Conversation series where I had a great deal of fun interviewing writers, activists, filmmakers, cultural influencers. And tonight I'm going to be in the hot seat. This is a special edition in which I am launching the publication. This is the official birthday of my 19th book, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. And I'm really excited because I'm going to be in conversation with and interviewed by Gwen McKinney, who is a good friend of mine and a fellow um, activist on behalf of Black women. She does great work for public policy and public advocacy. So thank you for joining me on this very special day. And The Strong Black Woman is a book that like many of my books, I did not plan to write. It's a book that grew out of a visit to my doctor's office in which I found out that sometime in the past I had had two silent strokes. And that shook me to my core because I considered myself the poster child for black women's health. And so I got to thinking about the whole issue of black women's health and I did a little research and found out that we're in the middle of a watershed moment where health, black people's health and black women's health is really being discussed publicly, privately, institutionally for the first time in some really important, really important ways. And so I really wanted to be part of that conversation. And so this is a book that I wrote. A lot of people had their pandemic projects. This is my pandemic project. I wrote it between probably March and September. I wrote it almost as if I was in a fever or as if I was possessed. And it's a book that means a lot to me. In the book, I say at one point that this is kind of the book that I've waited uh, to be woman enough to write. So the strong black woman complex or mentality, you know, I think any of the black women in the audience know what that means. Um, all of our lives we've heard, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Um, you have to be twice as good. Uh, you can't depend on anybody else. You have to be strong. You may not get a man, so you have to be able to take care of yourself and you can do bad all by yourself. So we're raised to be very independent. And the assumption is, is that we're very strong, that we're resilient, that we can come back from just about anything. Now, of course, this belief, which has a kind of a chokehold on our community, has its roots in slavery, where we as people and we as women were treated like literally animals. And so we were told that we were strong. And then what we did was we took that idea and like many oppressed groups, we turned it on its head. Okay, you say we're strong, we will be strong. We will be resilient. We will come back from anything you can throw at us. The negative side, of course, is that we tamp down fear, uncertainty, weakness, and doubt. And too often in our community, there's simply no place for black women to have a discussion about the darker side of the strong black woman complex. I'm very glad to be part of a multi-generational group of women of all ages who are dismantling that very dangerous ideology and that dangerous complex. We are as black women living in a health emergency. Um, people don't talk about it much, but it's very real. And part of it is because of the ways in which the strong black woman complex encourages us to deny our pain and to not prioritize self care. Black women have very high rates of depression. Four out of five African-American women are obese or, or overweight. We lead in those developing dementia. We lead also for heart attack and stroke, diabetes. And while we cannot snap our fingers and get rid of all the McDonald's in our neighborhood or snap our fingers and immediately have the kind of health care 
that would benefit all Americans, we can engage in the kinds of practices that will extend our lives. And I've come to really believe that if we are not in individually practicing habits that release the pressures that build up because we're victims of systemic racism. In a sense, we're conspiring with systemic racism to our own ill health. So what happens is of course, systemic racism is a constant stressor that builds up in our bodies, gets into our bodies like blood, like cells. And it's a stressor that makes it difficult for us to maintain health, to lose weight if we wanna lose weight, to um, fight diabetes, to fight heart attack and stroke, which is why it's so important for us to be proactive. So as I say, I'm really excited to be part of this ongoing and widening conversation. Uh, when you go on Twitter or, or any of the social media platforms, you will see black women of all ages just deconstructing the idea that they have to be strong all the time. So I wanted to uh, read a few short passages from the book before Gwen and I start our conversation. And I, I think I'll start with six myths that are that we we that are very prominent when we think about uh, the strong black woman. And when I was doing my research, I found quotes from everybody from Janet Jackson to W. B. Du Bois. And when I read these, you will recognize how strong a hold they have on us. A strong black woman doesn't let a tear stain her face, unknown. But what of black women? I most sincerely doubt if any other race of woman could have brought its finest up through so devilish a fire, W.E.B. Du Bois. I'm convinced that black women possess a special indestructible strength that allows us not only to get down, but to get up and to get through and to get over, Janet Jackson. Usually when people talk about the strength of black women, they ignore the reality that to be strong in the face of oppression is not the same as overcoming oppression. That endurance is not to be confused with transformation, bell hooks. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air I rise. My Angelou. Black women could hardly strive for weakness. They had to become strong, for their families and their communities needed their strength to survive. Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks are not exceptional Black women as much as they are epitomes of Black womanhood. Angela Davis. The strong Black woman is myth and fact internalized so deeply that even little black girls are treated like and assumed to be miniature strong black women. It's a myth because its endurance rests on our need to assert control in the midst of the chaotic storm of racism. It's myth because it is so deeply embedded in the collective unconscious of black women that it assumed and goes largely until now unchallenged. All life begins with is defined by, and even ends with a story. The stories and myths we create and repeat become sacred. They are designed to make and keep us strong, but stories are elastic and require revision over time, or they risk becoming brittle, dissolving into crumbs that leave us famished rather than fed. Stories are so powerful because at their core, they are aspirational codifying what we long to be if we lived in a world where anything really was possible. Black women have made of ourselves the heroes we dream of. So this is a book that very much like my book, Saving Our Sons and Don't Play in the Sun is a communal memoir. It's a book in which I start out investigating my journey from strong, strong black woman to what I call new age strong black woman. And it includes interviews with health activists, health professionals, uh, as well as interviews with women, ordinary black women 
who I asked to share their experiences dismantling the strong black woman complex, as well as overcoming trauma and moving to transformation and healing. And these are very deeply moving stories, very tender stories. Um, and I think the stories are so important because I specifically asked women who had, some of them had been in therapy. And unfortunately there remains in our community a stigma to this day around seeking mental health help. And so I'm going to read a little section from one of the stories. And this is the story of a woman who grew up in a family in which her father, unfortunately, was schizophrenic. And the fact that he was schizophrenic fractured the marriage of her mother and her father. And in response to the fact that the father was no longer a member of the family, he was essentially erased. Uh, there, all the pictures were taken down. He was not mentioned and he was literally cut out of the life of this woman. And she talked about the impact of losing her father and not ever being able to really talk about what it meant to lose a father and how she sunk into a serious depression. And so I'm going to read a little bit from that before, uh, and then I'll segue into Gwen. The anxiety, depression continued after college. Finally, it all came to a head. I was 29 years old, crying all the time, sleeping excessively. My energy felt low, heavy. I had trouble sleeping. I was quickly becoming addicted to a nighttime over-the-counter medicine for insomnia. I felt miserable and so alone. I wanted help. I wanted to tell someone about being depressed all the time, but there was this argument raging in my head. What will happen if I tell the truth? Will I be erased like my dad? Finally, one night, just before I was getting ready to sip, sip the medicine, a voice, I can only call it God, told me to go to therapy told me I had nothing to fear, told me it would be all right. I was so disenchanted by how I saw my mother use the church to run from her problems that I hadn't been inside a church in 14 years, but God or one of his angels found me anyway. The first therapist immediately wanted to put me on drugs that I didn't feel I needed. The second therapist felt I would probably only need one visit. The third therapist she just had this calm, this soothing energy, and I started crying the moment I sat down in the chair. She handed me a tissue, and I just felt completely safe with her. I saw her twice a week for two years, and she was excellent at helping me unpack everything I had buried from the age of seven to 32. And this woman shared with me that she began to share with her friends the fact that she was in therapy. She got so comfortable that she could talk about being in therapy the way we talk about buying a new dress or a, a something that we saw on Facebook. And she said that her friends would quietly seek her out and they would say, thank you for telling me that because I've always wanted to get help. And now that I've seen you, I know I can do it too. So these stories are enormously important to tell and to read. And um, one of the biggest surprises I got when I was doing my research was interviewing a doctor, a therapist in Atlanta, Dr. Kanika Bell, who did a study of Black women, Black women therapists, uh, about their ideas about peace and joy and happiness. And I'm going to read what the conclusion, Dr. Bell wrote, it appears that the first step to achieving inner peace for black women may be believing that peace is even possible for black women. A number of participants had trouble themselves, even identifying with the concept of true happiness, balance and mental health. Many black women see peace as a luxury for white women and as something not allowed for black women. So, I want to introduce my good friend, my buddy, Gwen McKinney. 
Wow, what a way to come <laughs> into that. <laughs> Gwen McKinney, founder of McKinney and Associates, birthed and sustained the first black woman-owned communications firm in the nation's capital dedicated to progressive public policy. She's represented and collaborated with prominent thought leaders and change agents advancing rights and equality. Since 1990, Gwen's vision of racial and gender justice has been translated into a bold and tested suite of strategic communications employing her skills as a journalist, advocate, and content creator. Today, that acumen is being honed into the unfolding of a public engagement initiative that she created in 2020. I guess that was your pandemic project <laughs> coinciding with the 100th anniversary of women's voting rights with a focus on democracy and inclusion for, by, and about Black women. Today, Unerased Black Women Speak is committed to shaping narrative and creating content that tells a continuous and unfolding story of Black women. Her work embraces and shares the power and voice and vision, engaging Black women, their community allies, and the world that affirms or challenges their power to speak. Gwen, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you, but I'm telling you, what a subject. Leave it to our literary legend, Marita Golden, to, to really bring that out. And you know what? I am so honored to be here and to your, your audience and all the followers out there. Question for you, because we want you to, to kind of chime in where you can. Who is a strong Black woman in your life? And is that person still around? And has, has that woman left an indelible imprint on you? Just tell us. So, so that's going to get us started. The question before we get to Marita, I actually was so moved by the opening of your book. Let's talk about, let's dig a little deeper into that MRI, Marita. That experience, which was, which you really, we felt like we were in the exam room with you. That revelation of the, the two silent strokes, which just was transformative. And it sounds like for you, it was a moment of reckoning. Obviously, it spurred this book in part, <laughs> but what else did that do to inform and take you forward? Well, I have to say that I have a history of stroke. My mother died of a stroke. My father died of a heart attack. And because they both died when I was in my 20s, I decided very early that I would do everything I could to be healthy. So from my 20s, I started exercising, meditating, trying to eat right. And that's why it was such a surprise to me that I'd had two silent strokes. Now, first thing, silent strokes are quite common. I mean, I could be having a silent stroke right now, mm -hmm. just like that and not even know it. Um, but I thought if I had not been doing so many things right, if I had not for the last uh, decades been exercising, going to a therapist when I needed to, if I hadn't done all of those things, those strokes might have been fatal. And that's what I thought. Okay. I thought the lifestyle I had lived had actually saved me from more lethal strokes because my mother had one stroke when I was 12. She recovered from that. Then she had her fatal stroke when I was 21. Mm -hmm. So, and and it also, and then it, it got me also thinking about how, yes, I'm the poster child, but Marita, you know, I still have some strong black women things in me. For example, I uh, am a cancer survivor, but I've never called myself a cancer survivor. Um, I'm going to speak very clearly here. Uh, during my, during my regular colonoscopy, a, to a polyp was found, a tumor, a tiny tumor was found in my rectum. We're getting real here tonight, okay. And because I was, was regular with my colonoscopies, that tumor, which was very tiny, was found to be 
um, malignant, but they took it out. It was so small that I didn't have to have chemo, didn't have to have anything. So I said, oh, Marita, you're not a cancer survivor, but I am. I just didn't want to say that word because I felt that would chip away at wow. my image of myself. That's so amazing. so the, the MRI and everything took me on a real interesting journey. And, and you know what? I'm going to push a little bit on that. You argue that you did everything right, or so you thought, mm -hmm. and your body was punishing you in some way. At one point, you kind of raise that up. What about, and this is, this is not with judgment on my part, it's just for polemics. What about the women who don't do everything right? Are we saying that if you do it right, it doesn't matter? If you don't do it right, fate will catch up with you and you'll be punished either way. What does that and you you talk Well, we're bit. gonna be we're, we're gonna be punished either way. We're gonna die. That's the ultimate punishment. <laughs> so exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> my goal is not to live forever. It is to live a lifestyle that gives me a fighting chance of living as long as I can. And for example, in the book, I have a I have an imaginary scenario where I contrast two black women, one kind of a working class sister and the other like a corporate sister. And I talk about the stresses and strains in their lives that prevent them from engaging in and prioritizing self-care. Mm. So in the book, I'm trying to really understand the pressures. You know, you got to take care of your mother. You know, if you're a black woman in a high level cor corporate job, even if they do have a gym in the building, on your lunch hour, you don't feel like going to the gym. You just want to chill and relax. And, you know, and there are all these reasons that can make it very challenging, but we have to find ways to get around those challenges. I really, because this is very serious. I mean, because for example, one of the organizations that's doing a lot of good work is Girl Trek which is an organization right. that mm -hmm. encourages black women to walk. Mm -hmm. And my God, walking, just taking a walk regularly is so good for your health, mentally and physically. And they talk about how many of the, the diseases that even, even depression can be helped by walking. Absolutely. That, that, that we don't have to say that we're fated as black women mm -hmm. to have diabetes, that we're fated. So so you're also talking about quality of life too. And that's one of the things that you've actually embraced. What did you learn about yourself writing this book? And also two parts here, what was the biggest surprise that you discovered as you unfolded the onion skin research? Well, I think the biggest thing I learned about myself was that I didn't that that I didn't have to hold on to those those still remaining parts of you can't tell anybody you were cancer. No, you just had a tumor, but you, you never say the word cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that I could get rid of that, that I'm still on a journey, that I haven't arrived. And this this mm -hmm. journey of self prioritizing, of prioritizing self-care is an everyday job. And it's not like I had arrived. I'm still on the journey. And um, the other part of the question was, what was the second part? So the actual, it was two parts. What did you learn in the process? Oh, you said what was the most surprising thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think the most You're surprising related. thing was when I talked to Dr. Bell mm. about the study she did. And mm -hmm. once again, she said, see, what she did was she, she took a group of Black women therapists and psychologists who mm. treat black women. And she designed a survey where she gave the survey to both the psychologists and therapists and their black female clients. And so many of them, even the therapists came up with, well, we as a race have to spend all of our time fighting for freedom. We don't have time to relax. That's for white girls. And when I read that, I said, you know, that's crazy. But then I flashed back and remembered times when I had when I had felt I don't have time to relax. 
I don't have time to take care. I don't have time to sit still. And how I evolved over many, many years into um, perfecting and into sort of doing a lot of the things that I do now. So, you know, it really is a follow up. I want you to give Black women who are within ear range a prescription for, for what's really, what do we do? Not just to be healthy, but to heal, because healing is part of that process and to be whole. Or, and you just <clears throat> dealt with that. It's not a flawed concept, is it? In, a, in the world we inhabit, to be healthy and whole, is it a? No, it's possible. It's entirely possible. <laughs> entirely oh, possible. Okay. Just look at, just look at us. Just look at us. I think I, I have three things. Um, say hello to yourself. And by that, I mean, find space and time in your life to meet yourself, to be quiet, to be still, to be silent, so that you can hear your inner self. Meet your inner Gwen. Meet your inner Marita, the you that has nothing to do with family, friends, or work. And you have to separate time out where you can spend with that self. And the reason I start there is because years of meditating and going on silent retreats and walking in the woods and stuff like that has helped me to hear myself, ah. hear my own soul and my own spirit. And that tells me what I need to do. Well, and it's allowed me to, it's allowed, it's allowed me to develop a way to develop a language that allows me to speak to the world and say, this is what I want. So you're fully evolved. No. How do, well, how how do, do you, you, start, you start small? You start All small. Right. There you Dr. Go. Pamela Brewer and I were on a great conversation recently. And she said that many of her clients, she, she tells them, find a space in your house where you can just have some alone time. And it's very difficult. They, they simply can't yeah. do it. The, the space may be huge. And I think one of the reasons is because it's, it's a multi-pronged thing. You can't just wake up one morning and say, um, okay, this is my space. It's really important to invest your family in the fact that you need to be emotionally healthy. Now, so that they're, invest, oh. they're, not, they're invested in it too. So that you're not saying to them, you know, oh, please, please. No, this is a family project and you have to have your space. And, and so I, once you've invested everybody in it, the pushback is a little easier, I think, to face. But you're, you're, the point you made about starting small, I think for some folks, because I know people who, when you, what you're saying, it makes sense to me, even if I don't do it, but it makes sense. I know it. But for a lot of people, they wouldn't know how to get to square one. So what? You say start with 10 minutes? Yes. Of alone? Oh, gosh. Yes. 10 minutes is great. 10 minutes of silence in a world where you're constantly checking your phone. You're constantly get the latest update about a brutality against Black people. Um, 10 minutes of, of silence? Oh my goodness. That's like a, so now I'm going to push again, push harder. You take apart this, and I have a black don't crack. I have several black don't crack. I met the woman who designed this. I have a beautiful top. I have a tank top. I have all sorts of t-shirts, black don't crack, because I was wearing them proudly. You take that down. You take down the concept, and in fact, I think in one, you called it chauvinistic, in-your-face race pride. Yes, yes, and, and it's, it's a multifaceted thing. If someone says to me, oh, you look good, black don't crack, I'll take that as a compliment, even as I know that language has to evolve just as we now have expanded pronouns from mm -hmm. he, she, to they, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other designations. We have to examine 
what we are saying every time we say black don't crack. We can say that, but then I get the right to say to you, you know, you know, one of the reasons you're, you're looking at me and saying that black don't crack is because you would be surprised at how many times I have cracked and repaired myself. And what you're seeing so, is, so the crack, is, is, the, is the cracks, is the cracks are part of the beauty. The repair is part of the beauty. Okay. Well, that's, that's what I say. We have that's to an interesting point. And I, I hear you in the face of so much marginalization and erasure of black women. If you don't say black don't crack, what kind of affirmation? Can you give our sisters who are out well, there? Well, the, the, the one that I'm working with is I am a new age, strong black woman because I am claiming the strength. I'm claiming the resilience that is part of our history and our culture. I'm not getting rid of that. I'm holding that tight. But the new part of me is combining it with the ability to ask for help. One of the, 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 the worst things that happens when, we, when we're always strong is that it, it, it actually weakens us. Mm -hmm. It corrupts the um, relationships that we have with other people. There's a point in the book where um, I asked my son if he ever remembers seeing me cry. And he said, yes, this was a moment when as an adolescent, he had made a bad choice. And we were all dealing with the fallout of that bad choice. And I said, well, what did it mean for you to see me cry? He said, well, it told me that you were my mother. You love me. It told me that you couldn't solve all my problems. It told me that I had to take responsibility for the things I had done in this world. So in some ways you're helping him as well. Exactly. Whereas we feel that if we show weakness, mm -hmm. um, that is that is damaging. Actually, it's it 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 is a form of strength. That's a whole new conversation that we're learning how to have. I had a conversation with a ten year old girl recently about the death of her father, and I told her that I you know I really was sympathetic and you know I understood what she must be going through and how she'd been crying. And she said, "No, I haven't cried." I can't cry. I'm holding it in. Mm -hmm. So at 10 years old, she's already learned to hold in tears. Mm -hmm. She's a little strong black woman. Yeah. And it, it's, it starts at a very early age. And what we do is we grow up with and buy into the tropes of this, uh, not just a strong black woman, because strength is, is positive, but it's like ball busting. Yes. You yes. know, <laughs> everything is negative about strength. Yes. yes. This, um, mama, mammy, uh, whatever. Every, every oh. black woman on these TV shows, anytime they introduce a black woman, oh God, here comes the bee. Yeah. Here comes the boss. Here comes the dominatrix. Or the you time know, here comes the unfriendly. Patients of, of uh, what's her name? Medea? Or yes. Yes. Well, you know, and I, but when I was doing my research, I talked with a young woman named Lauren Carson, who had suffered with depression, attempted suicide twice, and decided that she was going to develop a nonprofit group to help young Black girls deal with um, with depression and to learn how to express their deepest feelings. So she has an organization called Black Girls Smile and they are in a bunch of cities in, in, wow. around the country and they work with young girls in schools around journaling, around learning how to have conversations in which they're open and honest about their feelings. And she's starting really at the sort of the ground level, which I think is great. And isn't today the day of the girl? Something like that? I think we should we should mark that and embrace that. And that's very appropriate. So th another question that is sort of now, you know, really percolating. How do we begin, Marita, 
to talk about these issues with the people we love, with our families, mm -hmm. with younger women, with our, our men in particular. And let's take one at a time. And I, I particularly want to talk about the women because part of my work, my life's work now in my new life is to unerase Black women across the whole generational spectrum. So let's start there. And so what do we say and do, Marita, to help them move to this and to mm -hmm. dispel the myths and take down those tropes and all of that? Well, I think that those of us who are actively on this journey need to claim our sisters. And we need to reach out to them with love and concern. Example, um, one of my friends is a terrific writer. And um, I told her one day that, she, I said, look, you know, your writing is so great, so much passion, so much vividness, but there's a disconnect between the power of your writing and how you present physically. Mm -hmm. and, I so wasn't I say, and I wasn't saying, you mm -hmm. need to go on a diet. No, you what, like you haven't she, slept she, all she, night. She presents. Yes, but just how you present the energy that I'm picking up from you. And she she just sort of shook her head. And a couple of weeks ago, she sent me an email and she said she wanted to thank me for saying that because shortly after I said it, two things happened. She she pulled out her back. And then she decided to go to therapy. So pulling out her back was symptomatic, could be symptomatic of inner stress and tension. Mm -hmm. And she decided that she needed to go back into therapy. And apparently by my saying to her, there's this disconnect between how you express physically and what you express on the page was mm -hmm. a gentle nudge mm -hmm. that just was like a little seed. So I think that, I mean, and I had a friend for many years who um, was dangerously, I felt, overweight. And not until I wrote this book did I realize how the strategies I could have used to talk about her weight. Don't talk about her weight, but talk about health. And right. I think that we have to say to our sisters, I'm your sister. I care about you. I'm concerned. When's the last time you went to the doctor? Let's, uh, let's talk about this so that there are many ways that we can just gently, and Black women are great. We talk all the time, but mm -hmm. we don't talk about these things. Yeah. And we don't talk about the things that imperil us. So now what about our, our men? How do we get to Well, them? yeah, we need to, we need to ask mm -hmm. our men to um to give us space i mean in my and, and and i don't want you to say that i'm so evolved i'm perfect but i am married to one of the great best men in america and uh he he allows me basically evolved he allows me to be silent some days he allows me to go on silent retreats um he, you know, if I don't feel like cooking brackets, I don't say the equivalent of cook as your damn self, but I'll just let him know that he's going to cook his breakfast this morning. Oh, so I think that this is, this is a journey for, for the men. How do you love me enough to ask, to, to help me when I ask for help? And, and see, the problem is we don't ask enough. We don't. We I don't ask enough. They yeah. would do much more. If I we ask, saying, yes, we don't know how to ask, and I think that some of that has to do with what you're saying. We're we're so used to carrying the burdens of our family that you know. So to say to your husband, "Honey, I I really need some help here," or "Can you lift me up?" or we don't say that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and how we do we begin that? Because you don't, it's hard to just start there. How do well, we and, and that's where, that's where spending time with yourself, mm. getting clear about who you are. And in those moments of quiet and silence, that will help you build up the language you need to use to save yourself. 
you and know? to give and to give yourself. Yeah. To give that, yourself, give, think, give the brother, give the brother a chance to do something for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also you said in one uh, speaking that you take, you book a room from 10 to four at a hotel. Yeah. 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 There, there's this great thing I discovered during the pandemic. Um, a lot of hotels now will allow you to check in uh, from 10 to four from eight mm-hmm. to four. So if you want to just check into a hotel to be by yourself, to mm. read a book, to, to, to That's zone wonderful. out. Yeah. And so you don't have to do the whole weekend and that the price is cut in half. So, so I've done that. And I, and, it, and to show you how black women are, my, I've had friends when my husband and I first got married say, you mean your husband allows you to go away on a side? <laughs> What century are you from? <laughs> well, you said your man has evolved. But the point you're making, I want to go back to this because this is really, really starting small. So don't go to a hotel for a weekend. Just you could do ten to four, uh, just a day, and and the the benefits of that. Just be alone. Be alone with yourself. I have a date with me. I have a standing date with me. Yes. Go for a walk. And one of the great things was during the pandemic, I saw many more people walking. Mm -hmm. Many more people walking. Well, even now, because we're still in a different phase. Now you stopped writing, but the book you say was really not finished. You had to just stop. Well, I meant that. Uh, metaphorically, no, but, I I will, but I will say that I am working on a follow-up. All right, so you will. Um, well, 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 where you, I'm going to my talk question. about? Yeah, I'm going to talk about. So, but but let's say specifics. there is. You took my question, girl. There is a follow-up. Um, maybe it's an anthology. Maybe it's a, another memoir. Maybe it's a. What stories? would you lift up and push out? And I want you to end this conversation by giving us a working title. So we've got strong black woman. What's, so what is the element, <laughs> and give us a working title. It doesn't well, have to be the title. Well, it would be something like um, the soul of a new strong black woman, loving your mind, your body, and your spirit, how to. So this is the sequel. Possibly. <laughs> I, I see. And you know, honestly, no no book, no work is ever finished. Exactly. Because exactly. as long as we are taking breaths, mm-hmm. I mean, I as a writer myself, it's, as long as I see something that is my manuscript, it's unfinished until someone grabs it and, you know, it's published or whatever. So it's okay because mm-hmm. I think that people, when when you have your readers and the folks who are your devoted fans, they understand that your storytelling is a continuous mm-hmm. unfolding. And that's yeah. really important. Now, I think we want to- Let's, hear, you know, let's hear what the audience said about the song Black say, Woman. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear from uh, folks. Are we going to get some posts, some things? So, um, all right, Norma. Yes, sis. I know exactly what you mean. It's good getting away, having a peace of mind. Okay, you love it. That's that my sister-in-law. Your... <laughs> all right. I love the way she Norma. says, a peace of mind. I like that. <laughs> I love that. So Norma gets away. Uh, Arika Coleman. I am getting over the guilt of asking my husband for help. Go, girl. Yes. It's yes, very generous. Yes. Generous. You correct? deserve it. See, Black women don't think they deserve. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Arika. Who else? Let's hear. So Denise Riles McCoy, so many things you're saying to do are what my therapist has advised. So we're we're on the same page here, literally. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Letitia Burton has quite a bit. In, in Japanese philosophy, there's a concept of wabi-sabi, embracing what is flawed or imperfect, the art form of, I'm sorry if I'm gonna slaughter Ken Susan, <laughs> is the process of repairing broken 
potter by mending the areas of breakage with lacquered mix to uh, powdered gold. As a black woman, I'm striving to embrace my cracks. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. And viewing them as areas of growth and beauty. This is my antidote to the black don't crack expectation of the strong black woman. So you see, mm -hmm. Marita, you know, started something there. Thank you well, for that, Leticia. Did you want to comment on that? Wow. I, I love that, embracing her cracks and viewing them as areas of growth and beauty. Yeah. Because um, it's usually after a crisis, a crisis that you leap forward. Yes. It's almost as though you have to sort of melt down. Yeah. And Before rebuild. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, and the stress, I mean, and the stigma of seeking mental health care is not just in the Black community. It's in, in the whole society. Yes. And I just, as a citizen of this country, I'm just so, just so distraught that this is a merciless society. And we know that one of the reasons we don't have universal health care is because there's a strain of racist resistance to the idea of having health care that would benefit everyone, including people of color. And mm -hmm. that's been documented ever since um, from the time Truman, Harry Truman wanted to develop it to Medicare, which was going to be free until, mm -hmm. you know, the Southern senators said, no, wait, you know, we don't want, let's, let's, let's have charged something. So the black people will have to, maybe they won't take advantage of it so much. So we're living in a society that really is, is, is almost conspire is, is conspiring for our demise. Conspiring. And we have to fight that. And it's not, and see the next decade um, politically is going to be very, it's going to be winter in America times two. Well, all the signs, all the signs show that. So that what, if we can't elect politicians that will, be humane, we have to do what we can do in our little lives. And the little things we do mean an awful lot. And I think also, you know, and I think I would charge every woman in the audience to start talking to a little black girl about this issue. And you know, that is a real, what would you, uh, sisters, and if there's brothers too, it's a question to you as well, what would you say this is the takeaway here. Um, we have the strong black woman as a theme that we've addressed and interrogated. What would you say to anyone who you encounter after this discussion, um, addressing the question about you and where you wanna go from here? Can we hear some of the sisters to just jot that down and tell us, share it with us. What the strong black woman has taught us something. So for instance, Betty saying, getting in touch with yourself and not feeling you have to please everyone at the expense of ourselves is important, not only for self, but for everyone around us. They benefit from that reality too. Amen, mm -hmm. amen. Because when we are happy and satisfied, and I don't mean happy in a frivolous way, I mean a kind of connection with your soul, everyone around you, the gratitude that you feel, that is, thank you very much for that, Betty. But I think also you just said, you don't mean happy in a frivolous way. Why not be happy in a frivolous way? I mean, like, for example, we need to celebrate ourselves. I tell writers all the time, like, when, when I'm working on a book, I will do a, I'll do a draft and I'll send it off my agent and then she'll come back with her, re, her responses. And if I've written a hundred pages, I'll celebrate that the fact that I wrote a hundred pages. I remember I was working on my last novel, um, The Wide Circumference of Love, and I bought tickets to the Universal, so, Universal Circus <laughs> as a way to celebrate that well, I had written a hundred pages. Now, okay, say, so that you've say, got to celebrate yourself. It, what's frivolous? Well, we need I was, to. We need. I, I know mean, what you mean, but we need to be happy, 
frivolous and we need to be happy, serious, and whatever. We just need to be happy, happy. like a rainbow. Well, let me say it this way. Gratitude to me is not frivolous. It's, mm -hmm. it's a happiness that's through and through. And it, it has the meaning that you know why you're, and I mean, it's okay to just be happy, just be happy. But if you have, if you're grounded in that, mm -hmm. that actually, um, Marita, one of the things you said made me think about, I went on a retreat for one of my really big birthdays. When I turned 60, I felt like I had to do something important. And I went on this retreat and, you know, it, it was yoga, meditation and mindfulness, et cetera. And the yogis were talking about, oh, it's much better to, um, to receive than give. And I'm like, huh? What? That's, that's not what we, oh, yes, it is. You know why? Because the act of receiving allows someone else okay. to support sure. you in sure. ways sure. that you can't do when you're giving. Right. And do you know, it was an amazing, because I, I couldn't wrap my mind around it until I came home. Because when I went on the retreat, I was feeling like that strong black woman. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of everybody wanting me to do this and do that. And I'm giving this and I'm giving that. And there was a resentment. Yeah. yeah. And when I zeroed in on, you know what? I fell down the steps, girl, and broke my ankle and was laid up with a cast and couldn't walk. And my dear husband, who I felt I was given to, given to, given to all the time, I gotta do this. He had to literally take care of me. And guess what? He, now talking about happy, it wasn't frivolous. He was happy because he had a purpose to support me in exactly. ways, and I needed it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we've got um, a little time left, and I want to I want to turn the tables on you, Gwen. Okay. I want you to tell everybody about your exciting unerased project. I think it's very important. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for being uh, supportive. Um, unerased, you know, it's not a word I should really trademark it. It's not in the dictionary. It's when you try to uh, Google to get unerased is a concept of us doing what we as black women must do because the erasure through history and through up to this very moment. And that's why your strong black woman, uh, Marita is sort of a book into this. It's like, we are gonna be seen, we are gonna be heard. We are going to allow our voices to articulate what we want to do or say, and no one's gonna define that. And so we started this, actually it wasn't a pandemic process, project. It was, it was launched, we started planning in 2019. It was launched, Marita, in March, the first week in March of 2020, and it was supposed to be a civic engagement project going around the country, five cities, and it was gonna culminate at the African American Museum with a big event to mark suffrage mm -hmm. in black women's theme. Mm -hmm. Our suffrage began more than 400 years ago and has not stopped because we're still fighting for our voice, right? But guess what? By, by the second week of March, Lockdown, shutdown, pandemic, there was no events. It forced us to make a digital pivot. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing ever since. It was supposed to wind down at the end of 2020, but we are continuing because we saw the need, we saw the engagement, and we started scratching the surface. So it is the joy of my life. It really is. Give everybody the, um, the website. Unerased, and that's unerased with an E D B W S for Black Women Speaks dot com. And I also want to say a little sideline project is Primetime 55 Plus, which Marita is one of our stars on the homepage of guess what? 
Black women carry a lot of burdens and we got to unload them. But we're saddled with racism, sexism. And guess what, young sisters? Once you hit 55 on up, you're going to be carrying ageism in ways that yes. men don't carry. Yes. White women don't carry. So, yes. So it's a celebration. We are celebrating us. And I do right. agree with you, Marita, we have to celebrate. We have to embrace. We have to love on each other. And that's what this is. Well, I, I want to encourage everybody to check out the website because Gwen and her group, they're, they're doing really important things. This conversation about the strong black woman, this conversation about being unerased is really a conversation for this moment. In, in, in social history. Gwen, I wanna thank you so much for being here, for engaging me in a really good conversation. So I want everybody to visit Gwen's website. Um, and I also wanna encourage you to uh, order your copy of The Straw Black Woman. And you can order it by going you know, directly to Amazon. You can visit my website. For those in the audience, if you visit my website, you will find blogs about literature, life. You will find information on my 2022 classes. Um, people are registering for those classes now. So if any of you are interested in working with me on your writing, um, you can visit my website. So this has been a great conversation, Gwen. Thank, thank you one again. Thing, one from, one, from one new age one strong black woman to another. One thing, Go ahead. Marita, you are the gift that keeps on giving. You opened the door for a whole group of Black women, writers and literary, literary giants. You opened the door and you continue to do that today. So I am just so proud and honored and thrilled to be in your company. So I just want to and lastly, this Friday, the Hurston Wright Legacy Awards are taking place, which is the Black Oscars for Black writers. It will again this year be digital, but it was, it was fantastic last year. It's going to be great this year. So I urge you all to check out HurstonWright.org. This year it is free. So all you have to do is register for a wonderful evening celebrating Black excellence. Thank you, Gwen. Thank, thank everybody you. for being with me tonight. Okay. Thank you.